love of your life is. Happy Valentine's Day to that person. You look in the mirror and you look in the mirror and you see that person every single day. That, my friends, that's the love of your life. Do you recognize that? Have you seen that yet? That person that's smiling, that's staring back at you every single day, that person that's there with you without fail this entire life, that one precious body that you have, this one life that you're living, that body, this life, that is the love of your life. And when you can get that, when you can really grok that, when you can grasp it, when it is something that's lived and breathed and embodied inside of you, it is the most magical, wonderful gift you can not only give yourself, but also the world, the world in its entirety. Because we are not designed to give love and receive love. Ultimately, the highest expression of this life is to be the love that we already are. And that unconditional love, you know, your mind and its conscious thinking process and the body, the body being the life, those two things, sometimes people call it a forced marriage. One of my teachers calls it a mystical union. I love this idea of falling in love with yourself. And it really was something that I wasn't able to do for decades decades until I came across the human design system, started experimenting with my decision-making strategy and became somebody that I could love unconditionally. Because before that, when I was acting out of the not self, I couldn't love myself. I couldn't look in the mirror without seeing some flaw, something wrong, something I wish was different, something I thought was broken. And to be able to love yourself completely and utterly and uniquely and clearly without any, oh, I'm bad or I'm wrong or oops, you know, damn, something, pff, all that negative self-judgment that especially as a, a third line, there are three, a third line mind puts itself through because they're so pessimistic and downtrodden when they're not operating in alignment for me as a third line, thinking that everything that I did was wrong or bad or broken or a misfit or didn't fit in and didn't belong and too much self-judgment always. So I want to inspire you hopefully to remember the first and primary most natural love of this life and that is you loving you. And I have a little quote from Ra about how we're designed to love. This is the wisdom from Ra Uruhu, the creator and founder, the first messenger of the human design system with that beautiful body graph he uh, translated. You can see that he says design is here to strip away the degeneralizations that torture us, that we somehow have to be exactly the way Hollywood does it or whatever. Each of us is unique in our capacity for love and we all have it. The moment that you're living out your nature, you get to experience your capacity for love. That's something very special. And I can remember when I first came to the human design system, again, something deeply flawed about me. And my very first marriage, I've been on three now, my third marriage, my very first marriage that I had when I left that man, his aunt gave me a mirror, a hand mirror, and she showed it to me and she said, honey, this is the most important thing is to love yourself first because she could see how what a tortured soul I was. And I could not look in that mirror, gave it away or lost it or whatever, moved a lot in my life. But I, I really had a hard time looking in the mirror. I always saw the flaw. I always saw what was wrong or what was rejectionable about me. And it always came from my own personal perspective of what I thought was wrong. And when you can get to that place of loving yourself, and you know how I experienced it first? So I found human design in, um, or it found me, <laughs> took me by the shoulders and said, you need to know this, um, in September. I think it was September 9th or 11th. Yeah, where a guy said, you need to know this. <laughs> and gave me a short, very short, brief introduction to my design. And at that time, it was in 2012, didn't love myself, couldn't love myself. And then in November of 2014, 15, 2015, I finally, finally did. And how I knew was because I was listening to myself talk. And every single time before, you know, like hearing yourself on the phone when you leave a message to voicemail, hey, please, this is Lavina, or at, but back in those days, my name was Andrea. This is Andrea, please leave a message. And you know how you hate listening to that voice, your own voice? That wasn't my experience anymore. All of a sudden, and this is a picture, a selfie I took of myself when I realized I actually loved myself. 
And that day, it's just so special to recognize that there's nothing, nothing, nothing like it. And that your experiment, if you live and love and honor yourself first, and you become your own authority, you can experience that unconditional love of self, no matter the fuck up and no matter the mistake that you make, you know, no matter what the mind is saying you did wrong or judges, because the mind will always do that, this, that, good, bad, right, wrong, black, white, mind is always in black, white thinking. But we are multidimensional human beings. And I have written something here that I want to read to you. Inspired by raw, it's there's nothing like self love, it is the basis of all love and all of us are here to be love differently. You yourself, all of us individually are unique expressions of love. And then I share that story about decades, not even being able to look in the mirror with love and just crying instead. There was too much shame and bitterness about who I thought I was and the mess I thought I'd made of my life. Through experimenting with design, I found the man of my dreams and he's a fellow emotional projector and I have the sweetest relationship that is more successful than I could have ever imagined, especially it being my third marriage. So loving yourself is about loving what you are in totality unconditionally. When you live authentically as yourself, you begin to recognize that you indeed are worthy of your own self-love. And that is the most healing experience and feeling you could ever possibly imagine. Because the love is not about getting it from the outside. Why do you love me? <laughs> Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Nina. It's not about why do you love me? It's about being who you are so that you can love yourself because when you be who you are that resonance shines as a projector for me success it's sweetness it infects as a contagion it affects it colors everything that i do everything that i feel everything that i see and so it's a shift in your perspective when you get to the place of seeing your own perfection you can live the perfect imperfection that is you and really appreciate and learn to respect yourself when you can love yourself unconditionally unconditionally you are free to objectively love another without the unhealthy codependencies fall in love with who you are by being true to yourself always no matter what and if you are true to yourself you'll get exactly the right thing as me of those three third line the right thing that goes wrong, that teaches you even more wrong, <laughs> deeper lessons about what works and what doesn't work on the material plane. So for me, and this is my husband, thank you, <laughs> Paula, that's really sweet. This is my husband, Oren. We have a really sweet relationship. It was not sweet in the beginning. It was very violent. <laughs> we had a, a really, we have a very strong electromagnetic connection seven electromagnetics in our design. No compromises if you know uh, design mechanics. And one connection channel, as in companionship channel, that is um, where we connect to each other and see each other um, have a shared reality of each other's experiences. And so to finally be able to accept each other and love ourselves and then come into relationship, we kept going out and in and out and in and for relationship until finally, the next natural step, it just felt the, like the most normal thing in the world, rather than the multiple times before that we got engaged and then broke up. And I was devastated. The very last time I was like, this is it, I'm done. And I actually moved away from the area finally. And when I came back, it was just normal. It was natural. There wasn't any excitement. Oh my God, we're finally getting married when we finally did tie the knot. And it is because for me personally, I'm pretty confident in the fact that this human design experiment was the thing that allowed me to finally have a healthy relationship with somebody to allow us to grow and change together. And one of the saddest things that I see, oh, I don't want to bring you down on Valentine's Day, you guys, but one of the saddest things that I see are people in relationships where they're bonded by things that don't really matter you know, ultimately to the highest and best and the good of all involved, when they stay together, tormenting each other, torturing each other, rather than taking the time to separate, even if it's for just a little while, because as a third line, especially, you need to break the bond with what doesn't work. If the relationship is unhealthy, take a break. And if you take a break and you go off on your own separate ways, so be it. 
And if you follow your decision-making strategy, you'll get exactly what you need and everything will be okay. Now, just because you enter into this experiment and you are with somebody that maybe doesn't quite work and you're experiencing where they don't want to have anything to do with human design. I have a lot of clients like that who come to me for relationship readings and the husband isn't interested in human design for the most part. Um, they might be dragged to the relationship reading and maybe half-heartedly listen. But if they're not experimenting with their decision-making strategy, with their authority, with being their own authority, it's not going to make any difference as far as understanding what's going on. Yes, it can be helpful. Yeah, that's why you guys argue or that's why there's a challenge. But if you're not fully immersed into the experiment, you're not going to grow together. And what I saw with my husband, he happened to come across design about three years. He's been in it longer than me, but he really rejected it at first. He said, no, that's bullshit. I'm a manifester. I'm not a projector, you know, as far as judging what was being told and not allowing it to really sink in deeply. But he had a best friend who was a emotional 5-1 generator. So always called him a projector ass mofo when he would do projector like things. And so he got a sense of what the projector was supposed to be about. But when we came together, we could not, we were still playing that game. You know, that game when you first meet somebody and you're like, this is who I am. Look, <laughs> that fake false sense of self identity, who you want them to think that you are. Well, over time, over the years, you get to see all the challenges and all of the relationship issues that come between you and that other. Now, what tends to happen, you and that particular other might just um, be triggering old wounds for you to bring forth into the light to learn and heal from. And the relationship is the most wonderful place to be able to grow because it is what challenges us. It's the most beautiful experience and the best um, experiment is learning how to be in love and in relationship with another human being, particularly if you live together as we have for most of the past um, nine going on 10 years. So accepting each other exactly as you are, it has to begin first with you yourself. It's never going to come from another person until you yourself experience that self-love, right? So in your intimate nature, if we look at relationship mechanics and I'll download this presentation and upload it to wherever the video, a link to it, wherever the video is so that on my, um, website, humandesign.live, so that you guys can have links to some of the work that Ra has done on relationship mechanics to learn more about that. But in your intimate nature, your personal genetic predispositions, we have our own love languages that we can see right there in the human design body graph. We have our own sexuality style. That's where my husband and I are really compatible because we have a channel that is uh, driven towards a certain kind of specific sexuality. And the core of caring in the design, as far as your energetic availability to care for somebody or not, it's right there in the design. So we can see, we can map that out, we can blueprint it so that you can first understand yourself. When you understand yourself and you live life as yourself, relationships get so much easier. I think that's one of the biggest benefits I've personally experienced besides loving yourself is having better relationships, not only with my husband, but also my daughter. Um, anybody who wants to be in my life, I know rather than trying to push and trying to force or trying to pretend to be something that I'm not, I can just allow my body to be what it is. And I don't judge myself if for whatever reason, it's not correct for me to engage with that particular person right at this time. And the people who know, like, and trust me and understand, hey, Lavina is an emotional projector, limited energy. She'll get back to you when she feels like it, when she's in the mood, when the time is right. And when you can live life and experience life with other people in human design who go, okay, no response. You don't take it personally wonderful because that's what it, this is all about. It's about no fault, no blame, no shame, no guilt, no choice. It's not about trying to negate, you know, and blame and shame and fault anybody for anything that happens anymore. And it's so wonderful to have that kind of freedom. So I have a little quote from Raw to read. When you begin your process in human design, naturally, you're going to want to know what somebody else's design is. Isn't it true? Where 
you're wanting to learn what type they are, he says. And the moment you look at their chart and you calculate their chart, you compare it with your own, it and the obvious is really where you begin. So the obvious of type to type or not, center that is defined and center that is defined or not. And at the very beginning, he says, of looking at any type of partnership is really, you gotta understand yourself first. So before you dive into relationship mechanics, good idea to know yourself really well. Take a living or design class, read a book, experiment with your decision-making strategy, get a reading, a foundation analysis is a great place to start. And what he says is the moment you're really clear about yourself, then you're going to be much more aware of what is happening to you in a relationship with anyone else. The first thing you have to be clear about when looking at, at yourself is to look at the whiteness, the open areas in your design. Because remember in the transit reports that we're talking about, we're looking at how is the openness, how I normally read that chart is, how is the openness being affected by the transits? If you can understand what's you, what's consistent about you and what's not you, you can recognize when you're being affected, perhaps to your mind, negatively by outside forces that are not inherently within your nature. And then let go of the shame, blame, guilt, fault, regret, anything that you might see yourself display. Let's say you get really angry and you go, I'm not supposed to be angry. What's wrong with me? And then you start to try and figure it out and blame and shame. You can just let go of any of that mental blah, 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 because it really doesn't matter. All that matters is going back to who you are for yourself if you're a generator, for the other if you're a projector. What's your impact if you're a manifester? And as a reflector, the surprise of seeing yourself in interaction with the cosmos, the universe. So what Ross says is the first thing you have to be clear about yourself when looking at yourself is look at the whiteness. What I mean by that is if you look at your body graph, you will notice a limitation in the number of gates that can be activated in a design. There are only so many imprinting forces. The vast majority of your design, even if it looks like it's colored in a lot, is not activated. It's open, it's white. All of us, everyone has everything in the human design body graph. When you look at your body graph and you look at the openness, those are receptors. So here on this next slide, the openness. So in this example over on the left-hand side, you see the Ajna center, which is our conceptualization function, function. It's undefined. And so that's what happens to me. Anytime I'm around a defined Ajna center person, I'm amplifying their certainty. So just to know that when you're with this person in the relationship, because you're open, you are so susceptible to being overwhelmed by that person's way. In this instance, it's their life force about how their mind is designed to frame things or see things or know things specifically from the mind standpoint, you know, the research and the analysis, the organizing things, the making sense of things, how they know things, how they explain things, and what they think about what needs to happen based on what happened in the past. Everything that you're taking in from that person, you amplify. So that's what your relationship is always going to be like. And you can't argue with that person because their certainty is their certainty. What tends to happen, undefined Ashna, argues, fights, mental fights, you know, not seeing eye to eye, not being clear. Or maybe if you're totally open like me, completely capitulating, whatever you want, whatever you say, whatever you think, I'll do what you think, because you know best, you know better than me. Rather than allowing myself to come to my own recognition of what answers or what my opinions happens to be, for whatever particular, um, let's say politics. I remember my, my first family, I wasn't very political. Political stuff is my distraction as a personal perspective person. And they were very forceful and pushy, um, my grandparents-in-law on the maternal side, to vote in a particular way. And so rather than doing my own research, I'm like, okay, I'll vote for them because I don't know any better. You know, it's not my interest. You need me to vote? Okay, I'll go vote. Rather than being my own authority and really putting the energy and time in to stand up for my own boundaries of I'm a sovereign individual and I can make my own decision, I would just take on other people's concepts and run with it. You know, another concept here, like as an example, raw. Raw is very, very detailed and 
logical and specific about his teachings. But there are a couple of different places where I go, you know, I don't agree with that. And now I can actually voice my disagreement. Before, no, I would argue Ra's point without really understanding it clearly, what he meant by that or how he, you know, meant that to be. Instead of questioning, capitulating, or just submitting myself to somebody else knows better than I, rather than having my own voice and, and standing up for my own truth. So that's an example of what can happen in receptors, in the openness, where you think you're flawed, for me as an undefined ashna, thinking that, I don't know what to think. You tell me what to think. I can't conceptualize about right, that right now. I have no clue. So you tell me, you know, rather than being my own authority sacral center as an example i'm an undefined sacral center and the moment i'm in aura with my daughter or anybody else who has a defined sacral center amplification overstimulation potentially overwhelmment if i take in all that energy and try to do and keep up like her or like anybody else who has a defined sacral not here to sustain consistent output of energy because that's an energy resource the sacral center so in a defined state, that person has an energetic response and can, you know, nose to the grindstone motor, as long as it's something that they're passionate about, it's not going to drain them. It's going to enliven them when they use their energy up. Now, for somebody who's undefined in the, in the sacral center like I am, you breathe on my sacral. It lights up. I've got so many gates, so many planets there. What tends to happen is overzealousness and total overwhelmment and complete fatigue because I'm burning the candle on both ends rather than taking care of myself first. So when you learn what happens to you in relationship, particularly when somebody's got a defined center versus somebody who has an undefined center, it really, really helps you recognize the problem is not in the relationship or the other person. The problem is you not being your own authority, period. It's never, ever, ever a problem. Anybody's design, ever. They are themselves for a reason. They're here to learn through whatever challenges present themselves. They're here, to, they're designed by, like that by nature. And the biggest problem and fault finding I see in relationships is if only you'd be different, I'd be okay. Why do you always have to be like that? Every time I do a relationship reading, they're always complaining about the places where they have problems, issues, compromises where one person can't be themselves because the other person is so rigid and fixed and inflexible. And it's correct limitation. It's highly specific. It's finely um, tuned and honed to that person's nature. And if only each person were acting in alignment with their own truth, they would either grow together or vibrate right out of each other's existence. And that would be okay. And yet so many people hold on to things that aren't good for them, hold on to people, hold on to relationships way beyond the expiration point. So this raw, now remember something about openness, whether that openness is in a center, gate, channel, it does not mean it's empty or broken. It doesn't have to be fixed. It's just a receptor. These are all these open places in your design receptor sites or you're here to take in from others. So remember that when you're looking at your body graph, what you're looking at in the colored in areas is your differentiation. That is what makes you different from every other person on this planet. You look at a channel and you go, oh, you have that channel too. It's not the same channel, it's very different. Every gate activation operates in a thousand and eighty different ways. A thousand and eighty different points of imprinting. Combine those two together, you've got so many different variations and nuances and subtleties that create the uniqueness of a person's design. So when you're looking at your design, that thing that's defined, it's fixed and reliable, it's never going to change. And the sooner you surrender to that being you, maybe it's something that's unconscious about you, something you can't help. My daughter calls me a, you're a weirdo like five times a day, because I am, I'm a spokesperson of weirdos. We have the freak to uh, genius channel together, channel of structuring. It is about um, having a unique design of individuality. So she's really recognizing herself and our relationship when she's also saying that, but she has a lot of individual activations too. And being unique and different and yourself when you do that, you allow yourself to be weird. It inspires other people to be themselves as well. So 
here. It's not going to change, Ross says. It is your difference, and it is why everything in human design is based on trusting what is fixed to make decisions because those decisions are going to be correct for you and for your differentiation. Remember that body graph, that imprinting, that map is that snapshot of that moment in time. Your birth and three months before your birth creates the quantum evolutionary imprint of what it is to be you. But you are not that map. That's just the only thing that you can trust in this entire lifetime to be who you are. And that's why we give you strategy and authority based on that map. Most human being, Ross says, human beings make decisions based on what they're not, based on their receptors, the openness, based on wanting to be like everybody else because they feel guilty or because they've been shamed into it, conditioned into it, motivated into it, whatever the outside conditioning rationalization happens to be. So you know that voice inside of your head says, well, if we don't do this, then they're going to think that. Or we really better do that because, oh, I need to really call that person or really need to have to go and do this because, 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 all the becauses. That's the thing to take a deep breath. <sighs> Let go of that shit. That's not fun. Um, the voice inside of your head about yourself. Now, all of us have an ability to be a unique outer authority for other people in our lives in correct alignment. For me, as somebody who's recognized and invited, when I'm emotionally clear on that person's design, when they speak to me and I hear what's going on, I have a knowing that I can guide that person or not. If there's an or not, you'll hear silence from me for quite a while until I get clear. Sometimes I have readings sitting on my desk for a while before I get clear on what to share with that person based on what they're asking. Now, here in relationship, remember, one plus one equals three does not equal two because the two of you coming together make something completely and utterly different from what you are individually, completely and utterly unique to your relationship. So living out your uniqueness in a relationship, biggest challenge there is because the moment that you are in or contact, you are not who you are regularly, normally. You're now sucked into whatever that relationship expression happens to be. Its openness becomes where your mind gets focused. Its definition becomes your, you know, signature as far as the consistency of what shows up in the body graph. And if anybody's not allowed to be themselves, boy, is that where it chafes? That's where we have potential death of the relationship. Any place that you have an issue where you can't be yourself, you can express a core aspect of who you are in relationship with that person and you keep trying to shove it down their throat. It's never going to work. The only solution to that kind of challenge or issue is to surrender to the fact that in relationship with that person, you get to experience their flow of energy and see and marvel at that. But you'd never get to see the full totality of what that is because you have your own activation that's clouding or coloring the way that you experience that person. So we e never, ever, ever really know the other person. Not really, never. We only know them in relational context to us. So when we can get that and not take it personally, if it doesn't work out, all relationships have an end date because, hi, some of us, you know, it's time to move on or we croak and it's over. Eventually, one of the two happens, right? So it's not about trying to be together forever till death do us part always. It's about growing together in mutual recognition of the beauty and the wonderment of what it is to be in relational contacts with that other person, which is so different than this other person versus that other person. And where you get to really love the other, see the other for their beauty and their magnificence is a place where you have total, complete openness to taking them in. So I really love um, relationship counseling as far as, because I'm a a basic split and I'm a broad split as far as wide split. I can really see where people are coming from and have a recognition of where the challenges are, where the solutions might be. But ultimately the solution is always coming back to you be your own authority and it'll all be okay. People don't usually want to hear that though. They want solutions like right now, what do we do? Are we making a mistake? Should we stay together? Should we keep trying? 
or should we break apart? I can't tell you that. Only you can. Your decision-making strategy knows. So what Ross says is in living out your uniqueness, and yet we're not here to be like the other. We're very already very much like the other. We're the same species. But what's so important for us is to live out our uniqueness. If we don't live out our uniqueness, then the whole, the whole of totality, the whole of existence never flourishes. So in looking at your openness, recognize that these are receptors that connect you to the outside world. All of the openness in the design connect you to each other, connect you to everything. So the openness is where we take in. And when you look at the way in which humanity is designed at the genetic level, you will see we have a basic genetic imperative. Make more. <laughs> Let's mate. Friction make babies. Let's mate. Let's bond. Let's have more. Let's create more. Okay? So your genes, it's all your genes truly care about. And they don't, if they don't make more, they die off. So it's the draw to each other. They don't want to die off. They make more. The other thing is that genes don't want to make more with the same. They always want to make something new. And the more that they keep on making something new, the greater possibility of being able to withstand a mutation and to survive. So in the openness in your design, you're going to find what is attracted to you. Many, many not self relationships as in getting into the relationship incorrectly. What you'll see is in what you'll find is very different, like polar opposites almost. That might make good babies, but is it going to be somebody that you're really comfortable with in the long term? Are they your type? Are they comfortable for you to be around? Comfort or not? They might not be your type. They might still be comfortable because you have enough genetic similarities, enough of the correct alignment of your energies melding together into one. The openness is where we are attracted to difference. That's usually where we're going to have problems if we're not awake, if we're not aware, if we're not operating in alignment. And there's lots of, uh, you know, these words, fate, destiny, karma, they have very specific meanings in human design. Sometimes we meet each other life after life, and we're working on different thematics. We're clearing out old karma. We're, you know, evolving together as either a couple now or maybe just friends, or maybe parent and child, maybe, you know, uh, our familial relationships, or our boss, or work coworkers, our friends. All of this, all of us choiceless geometries, as Ra calls it, all of us coming together and then going apart and never, you know, challenging, or I wanna say, never doubting or shaming or blaming yourself if something comes to a close. It just wasn't meant to be in this life at this time, in this now. If it's right for you, even the parting will be sweet as a projector. Ross says, I'm not saying, by the way, that the relationship is going to be perfect. It's going to be that it's going to be nothing but sweetness and roses. It's not about that. It's about the correctness of it. If you're a third line being and you enter into a relationship correctly, in all likelihood, there's going to be problems because you're a third line being. Hi. You're there to discover what doesn't work. That's our value. That's our gift. What did we learn about what doesn't work? You're there to discover what doesn't work and the complexity of relationships between human beings is vast. There are so many things that can be found there that do not work, but it doesn't mean that the relationship was not correct if it doesn't last, you know. If you entered into it correctly, the relationship is going to be precisely what it's meant to be. I'm so glad that you guys have found this system because it really helps you respect yourself and the nature of others. If you treat them according to the demands of their strategy, so treating the other, not as you wish to be treated, but how are they designed to be treated? If they're a manifestor, keep them informed. If they're a generator, have the decency to ask them rather than tell them what to do. If they're a projector, recognize and invite them. If they're emotional, give them some time, you know? If they're a reflector, give them their lunar cycle, initiate them, give them time, give them space. If, and what Ross says, if you carefully shepherd them towards operating correctly as themselves, you can do that simply by respecting their nature. And yes, there are deep complexities in the way in which we meet and the various ways in which we connect to each other, all kinds of ways to, of the analysis of partnerships. But the very, very basic foundation of any relationship 
you do not have to go deep into all of the mechanics. You have to be correcting yourself. You have to insist on being treated with respect according to your nature and you treat others in that way. And you enter into new relationships according to your process of authority. Here he says inner authority. Some people don't have that. Mental projectors, you know, reflectors don't have that. Your process. Everyone has their own process of a personal authority. And if you do that, you will see that those new relationships are relationships that are rewarding for you. And the problems of the past, the problems that you've had in relating with others in the past can disappear. That's something very special. Just like it is very special to be awake and aware and even though you might mind fuck <laughs> oh you fucked up that one Lavina. oops <laughs> even though that happens still i don't take it personally i go okay what did i learn from that what did i learn from that that's the whole point as a third line mind third line being so in relationships in our correct alignment with each other we have a genetic imperative to bond with what is different and yet the sameness is where there's more comfort, where there's more getting along with the other person. So if you can follow your decision-making strategy, you can enter into the relationships that are ready for you to learn something from and grow from that are healthy for you. Always keeping in mind, because the genes are attracted to what you're not, like as an example with my husband and I, the only reason you see connection channels, companionship channels in design is usually because there's a lot of difference other places. And there we have it, seven electromagnetics, where one person has one side, the other person has the other side. It creates a unique life force in the relationship. And there are many different ways we can analyze or judge relationships. I have a relationship that looks great on paper. In reality, there are lots of places where we can challenge and struggle and grow together. And it's in the surrender to that being the movie that you just allow that and you don't take it personally when one person or the other gets a little prickly or irritated because one of us has overstepped the boundaries of the relationship as far as, you know, not giving each other, each other enough space. We're a, what Rob would say, seven and two work to do. I can tell you from experience, having seven centers defined in the relationship and two centers undefined in the relationship. That work that we do together to go out those windows together or in our going our separate ways, that's the most rewarding work I have ever done in relationship because it gives us the freedom. I'm a third line, I need lots of space. I need lots of alone time. I have aloneness gates or a gate, <laughs> a real specific one that really requires that I pull back and I have my own auric space. It's one of the greatest wealths I wish everybody could have is to have your own auric space where you can retreat, have your own, you know, comfortable, cozy abode, your room, your bed, what have you, and have your sacred space to have a break from the auric connection. Because if you're together too much and your um, too much muchness, the closeness irritates each other, it at some point, it just psh, electromagnetic magnet that also pushes away. So we need space when we have a lot of electromagnetics in the relationship. We need space when we're third lines. We need space when we have aloneness gates. We need space when we're projectors. Projectors, undefined sacral, needs to rest outside of other people's auric frequencies. My husband is a generator at night. Can't sleep worth it next to him. <laughs> Following your decision-making strategy, honoring your personal authority, it makes being together really sweet. Now, just real quickly to iterate, reiterate the point, drop a blue piece of food coloring and a yellow piece of food coloring into a glass of water. Eventually they mix together and you get green. And it's hard to extract or separate oneself out when you're in auric contact, especially. And when you're having sex, you know, you have that connection of all of the different um, energetics, not only energetics penetrating each other, but always also the genetics, the DNA, you know, having that live inside of you, you just have this thing that happens. And in order for us to have comfort and consistency and clarity of being our own being, we have to have our separation, our alone time. So it's healthy to have the things that you like to do, that you love to do, that you can do on your own without needing that person always there, not having to always go to them for the um, reaffirmation that you're okay, you know, and that's 
a great place to get to when you can love yourself and you can be comfortable with your own aloneness, even as a basic split, we're both splits. So even as a basic split, basic splits feel like there's a missing piece. There's something missing. There's something lacking. And it feels so amazing to come together in relationship when those, it feels like the other half of you is being met, that you found your other piece, your missing piece. And yet really all of us, all of us ultimately are one thing. Doesn't mean we have to bond with everybody. Doesn't mean we're going to love everybody personally, but we can love ourselves unconditionally. And in that experience of unconditional love of self, that being together, totally okay, totally fine until it's time to come apart in correctness. So in human design, we have some amazing material that Ra gave us. Human design sexuality, the caring streams and the ways that we're designed to care. There's some books that um, are available by Jovian on Human Design America. Love, uh, love language or love audio is one of them. Sex, I think it's the sex book is another one that's really great. And remember, you have everything in the body graph. So everywhere that you see, there's no planet there in one of these sex gates or love gates, yummy love gate. Oh, why don't I have that love gate? You do. You just don't have it defined or undefined. You don't have it active. That means it's a receptor for somebody else to bring that to you for you to learn from. So you re in reality, you do have openness to so much in the design, to learn the wisdom of and to experience the full spectrum of how that sex, caring or love can show up in your life. So never look at your body graph and think, oh, I wish I had that. Never, ever, ever. I used to make that mistake. No more. I love my design. And when you can get to that place of loving your design exactly as it is, it's so freeing. And I hope that for every one of you. So I can see I'm getting to the top of the hour and I need to take a break for my next class. I hope that you guys can learn to enter into your relationships correctly. And I wanna leave you with one last piece from Ra. The moment you can see love for what it is, you can really be with someone. I mean, you can really be with somebody. It's not like you're being with somebody who's a potential that you're going to work on, or maybe this will get better, or that will change, and so on. You can really be with someone because the love is correct. I hope each of you find the correct love in your life. First and foremost, the love of self, the unconditional love of self. Thank you so much for sharing my Valentine's and birthday with me. And I'm glad to hear it. Thank you so much, my friends. Take care and bye for now.